Hey, everybody. All right. So I'm here with Stephen Fick, and we are going to be talking about writing better fight scenes. So, Stephen, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, good morning, your everyone. school. And as James said, my name is Stephen Fick. I own and run Davenrich European Martial Arts School in Santa Clara, California. Uh, we can be found at swordfightingschool.com. I started fighting with bladed weapons, European bladed weapons specifically, in 1989. I have fought in armor for over 30 years. I fought with just about every version or some version of a European bladed weapon. I've even had the opportunity to fight on top of an Aztec temple in Mexico, which is quite the feeling. Um, I have done a fighting retreat along the parapets of a castle wall in Wells, where we were fighting from barricade to barricade that we had to throw up. And I had arquebuse next to me. So the side of my helmet was black from gunpowder fight, firing over my shoulder as I was fighting people on the other side of the barricade. So wow. I've got a lot of experience fighting in different <laughs> scenarios, different terrains. One of the interesting ones to always have to fight in is a river, right, James? Uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, um, so, Yeah, lots of things. Yeah. Uh, Steve and I have been working together for years on on many very cool projects. Uh, the River Comment is definitely one that uh, threw him for a loop. That was the first project we worked on together, I think. That was um, the first time I'd ever worked with you. Yeah. So, and and as far as my story goes, I'm a uh, filmmaker, a writer, and director. Um, and uh, f writing good fight scenes is always something that I really, you know, endeavor to do. Um, and Working with Steven was a joy, uh, not just because of his his depth and breadth of, of skills but uh, and experiences, but uh, his ability to adapt in the moment. And I uh, threw him for some for some loops, but we can save that for the for the bar talk later. Uh, one of the things that we really want to focus on with this with this panel is is writing detailed descriptions of good fight scenes. Um, and and uh, both of us have had our experiences in in you know different fights and different things. Um, I've been in in quite a few uh, combat situations myself with, you know, uh, being in Renaissance fair fighting guilds, uh, not to the to the experience that that Stephen has, but uh, uh, growing up with martial arts and all of that. So it's it's um, yeah, it's 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 something that I, I don't see written well regularly. There are some really, really good um, examples of good fight writing. Um, and and film but uh it, it's a lot of times i find myself going oh man come on <laughs> so uh one of the things that i want to talk about is the the five senses and and how they get kind of uh you know uh, neglected in in fight sequences so uh let's can, let's kick it off Stephen. Real quick? um yeah um when you're choreographing a fight scene for a movie or a TV or a play. It's a lot easier because we can show the audience my interpretation of this fight scene. Writing a fight scene is so much more difficult because we can no longer show the audience what I perceive this fight scene to look like. But a lot of fight scenes are written as if they should be watched. And as James was saying, the real sensation of the fight comes through your senses and your vision is actually the least of those senses that get used because your eyes will lie to you in a fight all the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and, and we were we were talking in the green room here right before the thing about like, the, you know, the whole the concept of time in a fight. Right. And. Uh, a lot of writers will say, you know, like time stops or time slows down. And like, 
that's that's close to right like my feeling as far as like what i when when i'm in fights my the feeling i have is it's similar but that's not quite right we talk about like kind of the the temporal changes that you experience that you feel during a fight the so uh one of the things that i like to say here when i'm training my students is if you are in the now you are too late you have to be in the and then but that's not to be in the future. If I'm in the now, I'm too late. If I'm in the then, I'm moving ahead of their time. I need to be in the and. Uh, one of my students, we were talking about it, and he came up with this great visu visualization. That's a tough word in the morning. I need more coffee. Uh, <laughs> and it's as if you're on the event horizon of a black hole. I'm not out here and I'm not in the black hole yet. I'm in the end. And if I do the wrong thing, I'm going to be in the wrong place. And so it's not that I am thinking about the future. It's that I am prepared for all these different options. And when you're in a fight, it's like being in a car crash. We've heard or many of us have been in a crash where time slows down as it's stated in books but it's not that time slows down it's more that we are actively using our senses to a larger extent kind of like that movie alice do you remember that movie yeah um, yeah i know what you're saying there's been a few times in fights where i could do it consciously and that's an amazing thing when you can consciously incorporate your entire area and bring everything to a higher perceptive yeah yeah it i i wish i could remember the exact quote from space balls but where they're they find them in the desert and they're like when is this it's now <laughs> well what you know like i feel like somebody should do like a, a an insert of this so editor when you you know just <laughs> drop that clip in right here yeah and it's it's a it's it's a strange thing because um like most of the time after I finished a fight, I don't, I have like no memory of it. It's almost like, like reality gets suspended for a moment where like uh, I, I finished the fight and, and I'm, I'm walking away. I'm tired. I'm bleeding. I'm, you know, and I'm like, what, what happened? <laughs> Who yeah. won? You know? Um, so, so let's talk about that expanded senses. Uh, what, what, which of the five senses you want to start with Steven? Well, um, Let's start with feeling, touch. But that's not touching your fingers. I mean, that could be, but it's a very, the fingers are a very small portion of it. Uh, our largest organ is our skin. And if we understand that, we can use that to feel the fight. Um, most people have never been stabbed, but everybody's cut themselves in the kitchen. So one of the things that is written about in fantasy and even sci-fi at some points is stab wounds. And being stabbed, it's gonna sound funny, but it really doesn't hurt. Yeah. Being stabbed feels like you've been punched and you're like, oh, that's going to leave a bruise. You just don't quite know that it's now a penetrating injury. And I know you've had some instances. Yeah, yeah. It's weird because it's a, it's a pressure, right? You feel a pressure like, oh, I just got hit. And then I, I remember uh, I had a particularly bad stab wound. I, I felt the pressure and I, I took a couple steps and then I felt I had the hot liquid running down my skin before I felt the wound. And I, I actually, uh, if I remember right, I kept going <laughs> and yeah. it wasn't until I looked down and went, Oh, I've, I've been stabbed. And then it was like, ow, mommy, you know, <laughs> like it, it was like, that was, that was really the moment where like I had to see it before my brain really registered that something had happened. And that's another sensation that, is an important thing to talk about is the filling of liquid on your skin 
in the yeah. fight, you don't know if it's blood or sweat. You really yeah. don't know. It's not until you get some other cue, usually vision, that you realize what it is. But if it's in your back or on your skull, you can't see it unless it's coming into your eyes. Um, so realizing that the stab wound is, uh, as James said, pressure, it's not going to necessarily stop. The only way you can really stop somebody in a fight is through gross uh, structural damage. That's why if we look at swords, the medieval sword stopped fights faster but did not kill as surely as the rapier or small sword. But with the rapier and small sword, I can get stabbed through the chest and keep fighting, but I'm gonna die in a few hours or a couple days. I can lose my arm in a fight. I'm done with that fight, but I can survive it. Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, sensations that we need to take into account when we're talking about feeling. The feeling of pressure in a stab wound, the hot sensation of a cut. And I don't know about you, James, but when I get when I get cut, it feels like a burn. Yeah. Across. It's not a it's not the pressure like a thrust. It's more like a hot piece of metal was just dragged across me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think everyone's had a paper cut right? Yeah. Like it's just, it's a paper cut feeling that doesn't go away immediately, right? It's just like this really hot, I mean, to the point where sometimes it, it, on big cuts, you don't even know exactly where the cut is because it's just this weird burning sensation. Your mind's just going, I'm hurt there somewhere. Yeah. And then when we continue with the feeling sensation, I feel it, but if it's deep enough or uh, bad enough, I, or the weapon's sharp enough, I may not feel it until I feel the liquid on my body. That's yeah. the first thing I feel. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so we, we had a, we had a question come in um, and I'm, we're going to, since we're, since we're talking about stabbing and everything, I think it's a, a good place to put that. It says many fight scenes have someone stabbed and falling over dead. Is there any place that you could be stabbed and actually have that happen? Maybe a long, thin blade into the ear canal or something like that. Well, in the Renaissance era, um, the Italians were well known for thrusting to the face. And we've taken to calling it the cross of death. So from the eyes is the cross beam, nose, nasal cavity, and mouth. If I can stab somewhere in this cross area, I know that the structure of the skull is soft enough that the blade can penetrate into the brain cavity. So the only way you can really stab somebody from the front is, and pretty much know that they're going to die, is in this cross of death. You can go through the ear canal. The issue with that is people have a nasty habit of turning their head, yeah. which uh, is actually another sensation auditory, which I definitely want to touch on. Yeah. But the other one, and this is more sentry removal. Uh, it was really first explored by Fairburn and Sykes in World War II. And I mean, it's been done for eons, but it was canonized by them. And one of the best sentry removals is to grab their nose and mouth pulling up and you use the, the pain of the nose to drive their head back. But as you're pulling your head, their head back, you're driving your knife up through the brain stem, through the little hole there. in the skull. Yeah. And then you wiggle it around like you're whisking an egg. Yeah. So, so the, to, to kind of summarize the, the, the answer to the question, it's like significant brain trauma is a way to, to drop somebody dead with a stab wound. So you know, going it. in through, through the brain stem, eyes, nasal cavity, 
What about like uh, like spinal separation? They wouldn't be like they wouldn't drop dead, but they might drop. Um, it's very difficult with a handheld weapon, unless it's an axe, to separate the spine. Okay. Uh, one of the things uh, that I've had the ability to do is one of my students is a homesteader and he raises his own livestock for food. So I've been able to take lessons on slaughtering to help them fill their, uh, their larders. But in the process, because I've done that, I've learned about stab wounds. And I've, even after we finished one animal, I was able to take a sword and swing it to separate the head from the body. And so it's a different sensation when you're really feeling it. But if that only really works well if they're not moving. You're much better to do other structural damage so that they can't move. But uh, if you can get behind them, you're probably not gonna hit them on the spine. You're probably gonna hit them in the back of the head causing skull fracture or um, uh, bone shards into the brain, which can put them down. It will put them down, but not necessarily kill them. Right. Okay, great. Um, let's, uh, how are you feeling about feeling? Well, one of the things we talked about was like, you know, the breeze on skin, um, you know, uh, other people's blood, spit, sweat getting on you. Um, you know, I've had that experience where in a fight where blood has splattered onto my face and gotten into my eyes. And, you know, that's, I remember, I remember that. I don't remember anything else about the fight. I don't remember being hit. I don't remember like, but that is like very like forefront in my mind because it, it was gross, but, um, <laughs> or in your mouth. Uh, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, where you taste it, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, and it's it's a lot of stuff that people who haven't been in fights don't really think about. They think about the, oh, I got hit in the face and and that hurt really bad. Um, I can honestly say that every time I've been hit in the face, I didn't feel it until the next day. And then I woke up going, oh, my face. <laughs> yeah, the stab wounds, you usually don't feel until two days later. Yeah. But that's when the bruising around the penetration really starts in and your muscles constrict from it. And so you feel a puncture wound two days later, not at the time. Yeah. So let's, uh, what sense you want to do next, Stephen? Uh, why don't we do auditory? Okay. So your ears are an interest in the fight. When will, and when, I'm fighting with weapons, you can hear when a sword hits flat edge versus flat versus high angle edge. There's also the sound of the way people walk. Walking is a unique skill that you have to relearn when you're starting to fight. Most people walk up high or they walk flat footed and you can hear that contact on the ground and it sounds different. That lets you know where their balance point is. You can hear if people drag their feet and if they drag their feet, that means that you have an opportunity to move them in such a way that they're going to trip over something on the ground. And then when they fall down, you stab them on the way down. How do you see lightsabers being a reality in the future? Uh, oh, uh, I, maybe I'll try to post a link in the comments later about this. But a guy actually built a, uh, a plasma lightsaber. Um, and it's it even melts through a door. It's amazing. Uh, can't remember the guy, the 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 video, I can't remember the streamer now, but uh, I'll post it. I think it's coming. <laughs> yeah, and if I remember correctly, what if it's on too long, it melts everything, including the housing. So it's got yeah. a very short shelf life right now. Yeah, 
Uh, and it's kind of more of a proto saber anyway. It's got to have a big backpack, energy source, and cables and everything. So uh, maybe he's we can... an early Ghostbuster. <laughs> maybe. Um, so one of the things that that you were mentioning is like I, I think that the 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 hearing a fight is 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 very paramount. Um, I I think that. Uh, one of the things that I noticed in uh, the training that I had with with you know longsword combat with uh, our mutual friend, um, he took a short breath every time he would he would start a strike, and I actually caught that. So I would know that he was doing a lunge or he was coming at me because he would take a really quick just beforehand that like just quick breath, and you know so I it was weird that I noticed that, but you you pick up those like weird audio cues because. I feel like in the fight, the thing that you're least worried about is the actual, or at least aware about is the actual fighting, like yeah. watching the, you know, it, it, like I don't, I don't really have memories of watching movements or swords or like I'm watching feet and eyes and listening to breath. And so it's kind of an, it's kind of an interesting, yeah, this, the hacksmith, that's it. Yes. Thank you, Shalina. Um, yeah. Um, what what else like uh, and and somebody somebody commented that the uh, this panel is very grim and it is because we're talking about fighting, um, and and trying to get authentic fighting in your writing. Um, we're not trying to be gross, like well maybe a little bit, but um, yeah. So uh, well, if I can go sidetrack real go quick, Amy asked, what would be the bleed out time for a fem femoral or axillary artery? There was actually a bleed out guideline written by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. And it's been proven off, but it's close. And something like a femoral or uh, uh, in the throat or the arm, you're looking at 45 seconds to bleed out. So it goes pretty quickly. Um, there's actually a, there's a duel called the, the jarnac chassinery duel in the 16th century where Jarnac hamstrung chassinery on both knees. And when chassinery, who was the queen, king's champion, was snubbed by the king for losing, he ripped off his bandages and bled to death rather than live with that shame. So mm. it doesn't take a lot of time when you have a major artery just pumping blood out. Uh, and blood does pulse. I got, had accidentally got stabbed in the hand right at the base of the thumb, and I saw it, and I saw it you know, doing small spurts. I'm like, oh. That's what arterial blood looks like. Oh, arterial blood. And yeah, but that's the thing too, because it's, um, it does spurt out. And that is something where we go back to James with you're going to feel it. If you have a character who uh, stands in front of somebody and cuts their throat, they're going to be wearing quite a bit of blood. It is not a clean yeah. action. Well, and, and, and it just kind of dovetailing between feeling and, and hearing, uh, I had a pretty significant slice wound uh, from an accident that happened really fast and uh, right down my shin that cut me to the bone marrow. It looks gruesome. I mean, still even 20 years later, it looks gruesome. But uh, the thing, the things that I remember from it, it never hurt. I never felt it. Uh, it severed all of the nerves so quickly that two things happened. One, I heard the whistle of the edge through my cutting through my shin bone. It made a whistling sound and it didn't hurt or bleed. It was just, it was so fast that I got to see this amazing cross section of my different skin layers all the way to the bone marrow. That was and, a uh, yeah, well, it was very heavy. It was a two ton air conditioning coil with a sheet metal edge. So, it. And, it, and, it, and it fell and sliced me on the way down. And the 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 thing that I remember, like there was this whistling sound and this buzzing vibration through my body from the bone actually vibrating with the metal passing through it. And it's weird that you 
you remember those things or you pick up those things. And it's all part of that temporal distortion that you experience during trauma, right? That, yeah. that shock time. So uh, I, I think that, I think that um, like kind of uh, sensory dislocation happens during fighting, especially like, uh, you know, on both sides, actually, when you're receiving pain and even dealing pain, like you're, you're, you're feeling different things, you're hearing different things. Uh, it's not just all about the punch. Uh, and I think that, I think that writers tend to focus a lot on like the punch, not on, you know, the, the sound of the person's head bouncing off of the, the rock behind them, or, you know, those, those different types of weird things that, that you, don't think you'd notice in a fight, but really that's all you're noticing is kind of these weird ancillary things. And sometimes your hearing goes away. There are stories of police officers being in gunfights. And when they wrote the report, they said that their firearm must have misfired because they didn't hear any gunshots. They had unloaded their magazine, but they didn't hear anything because the body had taken all their sensation and put it into their core for that fight or flight uh, protection. So they lost hearing. So that's not uncommon either. Just there is no sound at all. It's like somebody turned off the volume on the world. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's it's resource management, right? It's your it's your brain managing its resources. Do you need to hear? No, especially if you're emptying a firearm, that you know auditory trauma is is going to hurt. But your your ability to survive the moment depends on you reacting. So you can't be flinching from gunfire. You need to be focused on. So it's just this really cool resource management system that the brain has. And if you are in a helmet, whether it's a nightly helmet or a space helmet, there is going to be the echo of you talking if we are like your your screenplay that you've written james soul if they're wearing a helmet they're talking into a mic but there's still going to be the echo of their voice bouncing inside the helmet and so if there's no some no kind of uh system in play that echo is something that you're going to hear and that includes your breathing yeah, I was just gonna say that uh, when I when I did the the armor combat, uh, I had a really hard time hearing anything over my breath. You know, yeah. just swinging the heavy sword, wearing the heavy armor. All I heard was <laughs> as I was dying inside this this metal box. Um, Which actually brings up another really interesting sensation: if you breathe through your mouth under stress or like you have to be wearing a face mask for some reason, your body thinks it is not getting enough oxygen and you start to internally panic because your body feels like it's being suffocated. Yep. So you breathe better in through your nose and that tells your body that you are getting enough oxygen. Yep. So the the sound of the breathing, you can hear the difference between the nose or the mouth, which becomes very challenging if you just got punched in the face and broke your nose. Yep. Yeah. yeah, trying to trying to breathe around blood coming out of your nose in, in massive waves is challenging. I've been there. Well, <laughs> you wind up too. swallowing a lot of it. Yeah. And if you're breathing heavily through your mouth with the broken nose, some of that blood is going into your lungs. Yeah. So yeah. that's going to affect how you move as well. This yeah. really has turned dark, hasn't it? It it's really dark, but we knew this was going to happen, Stephen. Uh, uh, all right, we've done touch and hearing. What do you want to do next? Um. So, uh, taste. Since okay. we were just talking about blood. Now that sure. seems like a very strange thing to talk about in a fight. <laughs> if you go and lick your opponent, that's probably why you're in a fight. Probably why. <laughs> <laughs> but there are tastes. Um, yeah. And 
there is, of course, the taste of blood. There's the taste of smell or the taste of um, sweat. Yeah. But you also have the after effects of those. And a strike to the head, a concussive injury, even if it's not a concussive injury that drops you, can set off a funny taste in your mouth. Have you ever had that happen? Yeah, a couple times actually. Um, I, I tell people, most people don't know, uh, with concussive injuries, there are five levels of unconsciousness. You have a whiteout, and everybody's had a whiteout where you see a stars, and we'll call that a whiteout. Then you have a gray out, and a gray out is where it goes blue. Yeah. Then you have a uh, four, not five. Then you have a brown out, and that's where it kind of like narrows down to a little dot. Then you have blackout. So the four levels of unconsciousness are white out, gray out, brown out, blackout. And each one of those, you can taste. I know that sounds really funny, but um, when you get a white out, it's almost uh, like a sweet taste up at high in the back of your mouth. It's very astringent. It's very, yeah. uh, it's like uh, uh, sac uh, saccharin, yeah. very intense and sweet. Yeah. When you, when you get a, uh, I'll go through uh, brown out and go straight to gra gray out. With a gray out, it's a heavy taste uh, and it sits lower in your throat. Blackout, you don't taste anything until you wake up. Yeah, because you're blacked out. <laughs> <laughs> but, so you get that from that high in the back of your throat down into the deeper part of your throat that you can taste. And that's your brain rattling around in the skull yeah. and affecting everything else. So there's different tastes of strikes, of blood, of sweat, um, but also uh, if you're writing a book where you're in a battle scene, uh, well, you are in a mass battle scene, you are fighting for your life, you're going to have blood, sweat, tears, feces, urine, uh, intestines, all of these are going to be splashing up on you. Yep. Yeah. And even if you don't get urine or feces in your mouth, you can still taste it. We've yeah. all we've all had to taste that because of animals or children. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, I think a couple of things that I that I really recall from from my times fighting is uh, you get a lot of what what I refer to as like atmospheric flavors. Um, I, I was in a, a car accident and I put my head through a, a, a windshield and uh, I it broke and I remember tasting the glass because that safety glass has like a powdering effect, right? So I remember tasting it and I remember having the like really weird thought of that's what glass tastes like, right? <laughs> um, but even when you're when you're fighting, you you kick up dust and you start yeah. getting the like dirt in your mouth and you taste the dust you taste the blood the sweat the uh i've even where where you're you're really up close and personal in metal armor and you're grinding blades you're grinding on armor you can taste that metallic taste it's it's almost like particleized bits of metal are getting in the air or something you, you can know? taste vegetation yeah yeah right? now something that we haven't talked about is you're not always going to be on your feet. If you get right. knocked to the deck, you're going to be tasting other things. You're going to taste the mud. You're going to taste the dirt. You're going to taste the vegetation. Um, yep. You might even taste rocks. Yeah. Well, and and you know, I think that I think you bring up a really good point with like the whole you know um, urine and feces thing, right? Like when you're in a like really intense fight and people are getting hit and and especially, you know, head injuries or, or trauma. Again, it's resource management. Holding your bowels is something that goes on the wayside really quick. I mean, I, I remember 
I remember being uh, being near a fight where a guy hit another guy, you know, very hard in the head, and he wet himself just like right then and there. And you know, it's and even just being near the fight, you could smell the urine. I mean, you could smell the blood, you could smell the the urine, you could smell the sweat. Um, yeah. And this was like a you know ninety second fight, but all of those sensations, even being ancillary to it, were very real, very much like you know something you noticed and walked away with with details of the whole phrase scared shitless yeah. is a legitimate thing because as you say it's resource management uh control of the sphincters not near as important as keeping your heart or your lungs working or your blood circulating and your body right, and, is amazing right and I, I, you you don't even necessarily need to be active in the fight like it's not just hits where this happens you can actually be so anxious and scared about the fight that those things happen because your your body is going into panic mode and trying to isolate resources for the impending fight when you are looking at mass battles whether medieval or modern it's not uncommon for people to have this happen before the fight and experienced warriors will clear their bowels before a fight specifically so they don't have to work through that as well as everything. But newer, greener warriors who don't know, they're probably not going to be doing that before the fight. So that's something that shows an experienced warrior versus a new green warrior. Yep. Yep. Uh, Heidi has a, a great question that I want to hit real quick. How will all those sensory details change if you're in space, like on a ship or a space station, or even deep in a cave or subterranean? Uh, before I started my school, I was a firefighter. And one of the certifications I got was cave rescue. And during the certification process, at one point, I was a victim. So... I had gone into this cave, into a hole, turned off all my lights, and waited to be found. That's pretty much like being in space. You can feel the darkness. The air is cold. You can taste the cold. And on ship, you could also probably taste the recirculation of the air. Um, you have ozone. You can smell and taste ozone. And if you have machinery that's re pumping and recirculating air, and if there is any kind of combat and even minor damage, you're going to smell and taste that as well. And being in a place where you can put your finger right in front of your eye and you still can't see anything. The, the darkness is so oppressive that you feel everything. The sensation of, for me there, of bits of rock pushing into my back or my leg. I would imagine you could feel every little crease in your suit uh the taste of fear of you know what if i get a crack in my helmet face <laughs> you know yeah uh, um yesterday in my panel one of my things i referenced was bio of a space tyrant and i love that series because it's set out in the solar system but one of the primary weapons in space to space fighting is a small sword because I only need to put a tiny little hole in that suit. And then to feel, I, I, when I read that, to feel that rush of air, my air, my, the only thing keeping me alive rushing out and the cold coming in to feel that. Oh, no, thank you. 
Yeah, and there's there's other things to to consider too. Like uh, I I like scuba diving, and uh, while everybody else is looking at the aquatic life, I'm I'm the guy that's doing barrel rolls in the back of the group and just you know like having fun in the background. And one of the things I try to do is I try to do like a uh, you know some sword forms underwater, and it's really really interesting in that because you're weightless underwater, right? You're you're moving in weird ways that you wouldn't normally do you know on land you wouldn't move that way so i imagine fighting in space you know being you know if you were in a kind of a, a zero g or low g situation having that fight i i actually found myself like hurting like different joints that that moved in a way that they wouldn't on land so like i could feel the like tearing of you know m muscles that are underused um and I remember thinking that and, and I actually incorporated it into uh, some of my fight sequences where people are fighting in zero G and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not accounting for the, you know, action reaction for, uh, you know, counter forces and, and they're, they're, they're getting like, you know, the, the muscular tearing and they can actually feel those like small tears happening and it, it impacts their ability to fight. Right. We don't have gravity holding our body together at that point. Right. right. We take when you're and we take gravity for granted. Yeah. I mean, you get used to the idea of if I if I swing my swing my sword, gravity is going to help. I mean, you know, I'm fighting gravity this way, but if you don't have gravity to fight, you know that that and so much of fighting is muscle memory. I mean, would you agree with that? Oh, completely. Uh, I was at an event one time and I'd been in my full suit of armor for about seven hours. And at the end of the day, I took off my armor and, you know, I was sitting down and I stood up the exact same way. I stood up all day long and I left the ground. It was like I was on the moon because I used so much more muscle than was necessary because I was compensating for the extra 70 pounds. Yep. Yep. And we compensate for things that we take for granted, but if it's not there, like gravity, not only is there that Newtonian law of an object in motion stays in motion, there's that action of, I don't have gravity holding my shoulder down. Right. Or holding it together. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, Edwin's talking about uh, experience impacting, you know, different effects. And, um, you know, one of the things that I've always thought was very strange, and I've seen this in a lot of people, I don't know if this happens with you, Stephen, but uh, when people are getting ready for a fight, like if we're getting ready for a battle, um, I have a tendency to yawn a lot. Like I just start yawning uncontrollably. Like, I mean, yawn after yawn after yawn. And I see other people doing it too. And it's like, we're getting ready to go, you know, charge into a, a mass melee why are we all sleepy and and it's not you know i don't feel sleepy but i cannot stop yawning um and it's been something that's happened my entire life and i've talked to other people about it and they have the same experiences so um it's but it, it was it was always something that like the experienced guys were doing like anybody who's new was just kind of wild-eyed and yeah i can tell you why why this is your body collecting air oxygen it's like uh, deep breathing before you do a free dive your body knowing that it's about to exert all this energy is collecting oxygen to oxygenate every cell in your body uh -huh. so the yawning is your body drawing in as much as it can before the heavy exertion that you know is coming so it's your body preparing and protecting you interesting and that's something like an experienced fighter would would their bodies know what they're about to get into so they're right uh, well see, when you're small fighting, things like that when you're fighting uh in even out of armor but especially in armor you have to breathe differently yeah we normally breathe through our chest but that means i'm only using the top half of my lungs when you're fighting and you're exerting all that energy, you are best served to breathe through your belly. Yeah. Um, to have a, uh, an experienced fighter will never have a body like Brad Pitt. We're just 
we, we expand our belly and it's always about pulling as much oxygen as deep into the lungs as possible. And learning how to move your breathing from your upper chest to your belly is a skill. But when you yawn, what happens to your belly? Oh, yeah, it takes it. Yeah. That's because you're drawing oxygen as far down into your lungs as possible. Ah, very and that's cool. What experienced fighters do. They yeah. get as much as they can because they know that in the pro even if they don't know it here, they know it here that in the process they're not going to have the same amount of oxygen. Yeah. All right, we're we're getting close to our time here, so let's let's talk about smell because it's my favorite one. Okay. <laughs> and it, I think we segue good from taste to smell. So one of my favorite smells that really got me going and it's something that you don't think about when you're using blade if you've never fought with bladed weapons and that is the smell of ozone. Yep. <laughs> if I smell ozone, my body just like we're in and I'm I'm good to go. Uh, yep. But ozone has, you know, we smelt it in lightning storms. But it's a different smell of ozone when you have metal gliding and shaving other metal off. And the smell of ozone just pumps me up. Yep. Yep. Same here. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a special smell. I actually experienced it just the other day. We got some geodes and uh, we were trying to chisel them open. And that like, I don't know if it was the hammer on the chisel or the 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 metal in the it was actually sparking off of the geode but i started getting that ozone smell and i found myself getting all like riled up and everybody's like what and they were like just stop stop it was a very hard geode it took forever to open up but uh everybody was like stop stop i'm like no i can't i must defeat this geode and i think it was more the smell of, you know that combat smell that yeah. that really just got me going man i don't know why the other thing is it's been shown that people smell different to different people and it's a um, mating thing. Yeah. If somebody smells good to you, you're more likely to mate with them than if they don't. I've met several very attractive women that just didn't smell good to me. It's just, it, it's a, it's a thing, but I bring this up because when you're fighting, you can smell the other person. Yep. A bladed fight or a hand-to-hand -hand fight is so much closer than what we think of when we have guns or anything like that. Even a spear fight, uh, you end up locking into each other and you can smell their skin, even yeah. through armor. You can smell yeah. the oil on their equipment. You know, yeah. um, one of the ways that they used to shine their armor was with pig grease. Yeah. Pig grease goes rancid. Their armor smells rancid. And that's a smell that you're going to get. Yeah. That's, you know, the smell of that rancid pig grease or the smell of tallow because they'll use tallow to put on their armor or their swords. Uh, urine, a, a way to clean armor was a rag dipped in vinegar and sand or urine and sand. And then you use that, you've now created sandpaper to get the rust off of your armor. That armor is going to smell like vinegar or piss. Yeah. Right? And you're going to smell Yeah, I that. mean, e even playing high school football, like I, I remember the smell the, the, the you could uh, the guys who didn't wash their uniforms or their their pads like they smelled so thick of ammonia and bleach and like just like you'd tackle them and you just stand up and your eyes are watering from the smell and that was just football uh, yeah. in imagine, combat situations the smells are intense yeah and imagine being on campaign for a year right and not washing your clothes very often or if we look at World War II, when yeah. you're uh, on the front line for two weeks in the mud, you know, there's going to be some yeah. interesting smells. 
Yeah. So Jennifer, Jennifer asked, what about burns and battles? Do you notice them right away or is it delayed like a stab wound? Um, I've never been burned in a battle, but I've burned myself. Oh, well, I was a roofer when I was younger and I had coated this part of my hand in hot tar, which I will tell you was unpleasant. Uh, you feel that right away. There is no getting away from that. And no matter how much you move your body, you will continue to feel it. It's yeah. debilitating. Yeah. I, I've, I've never been burned in a fight. So that's, that's an interesting thing to think about. I have been burned in like a very like physical situation where I was doing other things and, and got burned. And I did notice the smell of burning meat first. <clears throat> and it was very odd because it smelled really good. Like it smelled like really good barbecue. And I, I remember my stomach growled um, and I was, I realized I was hungry. And then I realized I had burned my hand really bad. And I was like, that's weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the, the, the thing that I remember most about that, that bad burn was that it kept burning and kept getting worse, even though the, the heat source had gone away. Um, uh, and like even like sticking it in cold water and like bringing it out, like the burn would continue to build. Uh, and and evidently the science in that is that the actual temperature goes deep into your muscle tissue and sticks around. So, um, yeah, uh, definitely smelled it before I felt it, though. And I would assume that this would be true in a laser burn in space. And if they're doing some kind of laser weapon that and even whether you get hit or the person next to you get hit you're going to smell it so that's an interesting thought that you know you're in the middle of a battle and the guy right next to you gets lasered and your stomach growls now not only yeah. did you lose your body, right, well, we're... but you're sick with yourself yeah well we're over time uh there's another great question jump into the discord and chat with steven and i we can keep this going uh Keep asking the questions. Writing good fight scenes, I think, is very important. Stephen, thank you so much for chatting with me and, and sharing your knowledge and experience with us. And, uh, you know, get with us afterwards and find out how to find Stephen. And we'll put some links in the description of this video so you can track us both down. Uh, have a great day, Stephen. Hope you stick around for the rest of the con. Thank you very much. I am new to Discord, so I'm not quite sure how to use it very well. I will do my best to get there, but ask questions. Uh, James and I can, I get back to you and I thank you for having me. It was great. Always a pleasure. A little disgusting.